any um okay Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to see so many people with us today. Uh, my name is Caroline Stad and I work for FAO, and I will be guiding us during the seminar today. Uh, and to start, I would like to bring a bit of uh, information about the importance of this topic and why we are today discussing this. The discussion between land tenure and natural resource man management is key, and not connecting both of them together can lead to not a successful process in both of them. Uh, my side, normally I, I work for the natural resource management, and in my well, past three, four years, we can see that trending the discussion on land tenure in this process is very important because it's very difficult to convince people to change a behavior if they don't have the tenury of the land. So when you talk about sustainable development and sustainable practice, it's very difficult to do it if you don't have the ownership of the tenury or the rights to manage and use that land in the way, in the way you think it fits. And when you need to change uh, practices, normally we don't have results in the next year. It's a long term. So on that, the tenure process comes very close and together with this discussion. So with this in mind, I think we need to look at this process and stop splitting this between two different boxes and find ways to find a very good connection. On that, uh, I'm very proud of our region because I think we are making very good steps towards uh, a better connection between these two topics. And we have some countries and some situations with very good cases. And on that, uh, I would like to remind you that we have the Q&A as, as option, so you can write us questions. But I would also like to invite you to write good cases if you have any kind of positive or even negative situations, please write them down and I will be monitoring this chat and I will be very happy to read them because I think giving the color of what's really happening in our region is really important. Uh, having said that, um, I also like to bring attention to that this is a the last of three seminars. So we are doing regional seminars in, um, we had one in Africa and Arabic regions, um, I think on Monday. Yesterday you have one on for the Latin American region and today we closed the cycle of three webinars in our Europe and Central Asia, our region. And also we have very important partners that are having, having, um, helping us today and in this very long process between the connection of just topa, just two topics. And I would like to bring attention to Landesa, Land Portal, and ILT. And we will you bring them again during the, the discussion today? Just a few reminders for us. Interpretation is available and you can see 
the little icon that's kind of a, a globe on the bottom of your screen and you can have uh, Russian and English. If you are having any problem with this, please write this on the Q&A and we are going to monitor this and answer as soon as possible. Also, we you share all the presentations. So as soon as we finish the, the workshop today, we are going to send you a mail in a, maybe two days or three with everything. And the last uh, important topic, we are recording this presentation. So also the recording, the link for the, the video will be shared. So if you didn't have time to follow everything today, you'll be able to, to follow up on the next days. So now I will stop talking, otherwise I will be talking forever and people who know me know that I, I love talking about some topics and this is one of them. And we are going to have a few video messages from, um, we have two, uh, we have two video messages. The first one will be from Andrea Murillo and she's the Deputy Secretary Executive from the United Convention, United Nations Convention to Combat the Desertification, the UNCCD. And she has more than 20 years of expertise in sustainable development and has worked more than 15 years in Latin America, connecting uh, public policies and also involved in the negotiation of the international framework on climate change, conservation, and land tenure. Uh, so I, I said, okay, the future is here. Okay, here we go. Dear friends and colleagues, I am pleased that you are joining us today for this regional webinar. We will take an in-depth look at the role that secure land tenure can play to enable more efficient and effective conservation, management, and restoration of our land resources, soil, water, and biodiversity. As you know, the UNCCD was the first multilateral agreement to explicitly recognize tenure security as a critical incentive and key enabling factor for advancing all dimensions of sustainable development. How land is managed impacts climate, biodiversity, and our health and livelihoods. Therefore, we cannot overlook its governance and the rights of the people who care for and work for the land. Since 2019, the UNCCD has been working closely together with food and agriculture organization and other partners to respond to the mandates given by our parties through the land tenure decisions adopted at the COP. We have produced a technical guide on how to integrate the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure into land degradation neutrality targets and the implementation of the convention. Central to the guide is the recognition of equal use and the legitimate ownership rights for women and other vulnerable groups, which we are also advocating for through the UNCCD's global campaign, Her Land, Her Rights to raise awareness on the importance of this step for the well-being of women and girls, but also for the benefit of people and planet. Upon request from our country parties, the UNCCD, FAO, and other partners stand ready to assist with capacity building and technical support. Shortly, we will open a call for multi-stakeholder requests for consultations on land tenure. It is our aim and hope that the results of this consultation will be concrete and actionable, and that will allow to us to bring the conversation one step further as next session of the Committee for the Review of the Implementation of the Convention, CRIG, which will take place in Samarkand in October, and of course, at our COP16 next year in Saudi Arabia. I thank you for your attention and your commitment and wish you a very successful session. And as a follow-up video, we will have uh, a message from Maria Elena Semedo. She's the FAO um, Deputy General, Director General. She's an economist and she has been in FAO, I think for 10 years, at least as long as I am, as she's there. And she's a very strong advocate for natural resources uh, management and sustainable agriculture, but also she has been very supportive of this connection between natural resources and land tenure. So over to the video. 
Welcome to this regional webinar on the role of land tenure in addressing land degradation jointly organized by the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations with partners. Land degradation affects 20 to 40 percent of global land area, undermining the well-being of 3.2 billion people. Governance of land tenure is a key enabler to achieve land degradation neutrality. Addressing tenure security helps ensure that all legitimate tenure rights holders, including women, youth, indigenous people, can fully participate in efforts to halt biodiversity loss, adopt climate smart land management, and scale up ecosystem restoration to combat desertification and drought. Secure tenure rights are a key incentive to invest in land. Over a decade ago, government, civil society, the private sector and academia adopted the landmark voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of tenure of land, forest and fisheries in the context of national food security in the Committee on World Food Security. To better put these voluntary guidelines into action, as urged by members, FAO and WNCCD launched a joint initiative on integrating tenure security into land restoration initiatives. Aimed at raising awareness on the value of tenure security and supporting countries to integrate the voluntary guidelines into land degradation neutrality, this collaborative effort will be presented here today. Friends, governance of tenure and land degradation neutrality are sensitive and complex issues. Looking at the past 10 years, efforts by many stakeholders to improve governance of tenure at local, national and global levels are a true inspiration for countries wanting to address tenure in the context of land restoration. Today's webinar will spotlight such experience as well as useful resources available. FAO and WNCCD, along with other partners, stand ready to support countries to integrate the voluntary guidelines into their land degradation neutrality initiatives. Thank you. So before we start with several very interesting presentations, we'd like to have icebreaker. So our colleagues, uh, you share a link on the chat. Uh, I think you can see the link. Uh, can people see the link? Because I cannot. So, okay, now we have the link. So I will ask you to click the link and you have the options to add uh, three words that are related to land tenure. So the idea is when you hear the word, uh, the, not the word because there are two words, now, the, uh, land tenure, what do you think about it? So what are the main topics or the main words that first pop at your head? So you have three options to write down. There are no places to enter our words. Mm, what do you mean there? No. And then you have a word in counting. So Aureli and Mahir, they are... Okay, so there is a problem with the link. <laughs> so apparently it's not working. So I'm sorry for the technical 
Uh, I'm sorry about the technical issues. So we'll try the icebreaker after the presentation. So um, let's move to the next presentation. Um, Sasha Alexander is from the UNCCG. He is a policy officer uh, and he works with the UNCCG secretariat and he has the main focus on sustainable land management and ecosystem restoration. Uh, he ha has helped the countries in the achievement of the SDGs goals, especially the 15.3 on achieving land degradation neutrality. Sash, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Carolina. Um, dear, dear colleagues, it's, it's great to be with you today and um, have this discussion uh, about this important work that the UNCCD FAO and uh, many partners are undertaking uh, to assist uh, to assist countries um, um, to integrate tenure security in, in their LDN and, and restoration initiatives. Um, just for a quick background and a quick reminder, the UNCCD is one of the three Rio conventions with biodiversity and climate change. Um, our primary objective is to um, assist countries with the conservation, sustainable management, and rehabilitation of land and water resources. In response to the uh, SDG target 15.3, um, we now have over 100 countries uh, that have set their uh, land degradation neutrality targets under the UNCCD process. And uh, many of you are, are very familiar with that and the, uh, the impl imp implications um, that it has um, for um, uh, projects and programs in your countries. Um, a, a couple of years ago, um, we did a study with PBL um, and uh, we discovered or we you know, assessed that there were over 1 billion hectares uh, that have been that have been committed to restoration, uh, either under the Rio conventions or other global and regional processes, uh, such as the, the bond challenge uh, and uh, regional initiatives. Um, I know uh, that, that in Central Asia or, or uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, there is a, an a initiative uh, that also has a number of commitments that countries have made. Um, in terms of uh, LDN, um, just under half of those uh, billion hectares um, have been committed um, by um, UNCCD parties, uh, uh, countries which are also uh, parties to uh, the Climate and Biodiversity Conventions. Uh, so as um, uh, Ms. Semedo um, uh, indicated, uh, tenure security is a, an important incentive. Uh, it's a, or a key enabling factor um, that enhances the implementation uh, of the convention, uh, as well as the effectiveness of land restoration uh, initiatives. Uh, so here's a, a very uh, quick snapshot um, of, of how we got here. Uh, in 2019 at, at COP14, the parties undertook a, a, adopted a decision on land tenure, which uh, does exactly that. It acknowledges the importance uh, of tenure security and uh, encourages countries uh, to integrate the principles and practices of the VGGT into their restoration efforts. Uh, it requested um, UNCCD Secretariat, along with FAO and partners, to develop a technical guide which we did, and you'll hear more about that in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, and last year at COP15, um, we had a follow-up decision on land tenure, which um, reinforced um, the, uh, the call from the parties and, and requested um, further development of the guidance uh, so that it would have practical uh, applications uh, for the countries. Uh, so we are now engaged in this uh, joint initiative uh, to see how we can better assist uh, countries with capacity building uh, and other capacity needs um, so that they can um, uh, 
uh, integrate uh, tenure into their LDN and restoration initiatives. And then we will uh, report back to COP16, uh, which is scheduled for December of 2024. Uh, this was the decision at COP14, again, um, specifically requesting a technical guide uh, integrating the VGGT into um, LDN. Uh, so when, when we began um, in producing or developing the technical guide, we saw that um, the, the, the VGGT contained uh, many of the uh, agreed internationally recognized principles and practices. Uh, and so we, we looked to see how we could bridge uh, the, the, uh, the momentum uh, that we have now for ecosystem restoration, um, uh, for the global biodiversity framework, the Paris Agreement in, in the land use sector, uh, all kinds of acti activities related to mitigation and adaptation, uh, as well as the, the, the global land uh, restoration agenda. Uh, and so uh, we think that the technical guide uh, is an important connector uh, that will uh, enhance uh, implementation efforts. Uh, we will hear more about the technical guide, as I mentioned, uh, but just to say that it's um, it's voluntary and flexible, it's uh, action oriented, and it's multi scale. So it provides um, uh, guidance on a continuum of, of solutions, uh, recognizing that one size does not fit all. Uh, the technical guide is available in all six languages, UN languages and uh, is prominently featured on both the UNCCD and FAO web websites. We also developed an options paper uh, for COP15 uh, with Landessa, and we will have a presentation on that just to quickly highlight um, some of the key steps, uh, building how to build an, an awareness raising action plan, how to identify target audiences using a gender responsive approach, um, what are some potential high-level messaging options and, and how to craft or customize uh, uh, messaging for specific circumstances or national context. Uh, and then finally, uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, to see uh, what is the efficacy of, of those activities. So here we are with, with COP15 responding to the, to the decision and, and the requests from parties. Um, we are conducting regional webinars, um, and we uh, will look now to um, have national consultations. And we'll, uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll have a presentation on what that will look like. Um, the, the parties recognize that multi-stakeholder platforms are often a, a good first step uh, uh, if countries uh, want to um, pursue uh, more more equal rights uh, for some of the marginalized and vulnerable communities. Um, so we are looking at uh, laying the foundation for a long-term process. Uh, and this is very much in the spirit of the VGGT. Uh, so uh, the other the other issue was uh, exploring financing opportunities. Uh, can we make the economic case? Can we build a business model? that would um, you know, uh, allow for um, tenure uh, security uh, to be more prominent in uh, various um, projects and programs. Uh, the, the COP also uh, um, encouraged us, the Secretariat, to continue awareness raising and uh, to continue exploring uh, the use of indicators and data sets on land tenure. So we see this as a new opportunity uh, we have uh, uh, um, various uh, windows that have opened up over the past 10 years, so we're able to perhaps leverage new donors, partnerships, and synergies uh, that did not exist uh, when the VGGT was launched. Um, so, And we also see a, a great opportunity at working with uh, uh, country-specific land uh, policies, legal frameworks, national action plans so that we can uh, uh, achieve greater effectiveness and establish uh, these uh, supporting processes. Uh, we, all, we also recognize that this is, is gonna involve uh, a dedication of time and resources 
so that we can engage with uh, vulnerable groups and uh, uh, those that have uh, typically been disenfranchised uh, in the land administration uh, systems. Uh, so the, the GBF, the Global Biodiversity Framework, was ad adopted uh, uh, last December. And uh, here I just uh, picked out a few examples, uh, a few targets uh, to highlight uh, some of the, the potential synergies that we see uh, through joint efforts at, um, at global, uh, national, regional uh, levels. Uh, so we think that there's, there's a real great opportunity to leverage um, uh, collaboration uh, between the G GBF and LDN, uh, as well as L uh, NDCs. Uh, so target two, as you know, is uh, areas under effective restoration. Target 10 focuses on production landscapes, um, how we uh, use regenerative uh, biodiversity friendly practices um, uh, to uh, increase the sustainability of our of our food systems and and other uh, raw materials and other uh, ecosystem services that we that we get from from the land, uh, and then target twenty three, which is uh, very specific in terms of calling for a gender responsive approach, uh, and specifically recognizing women's equal rights and access uh, to land and natural resources. Um, so a quick overview of, of, of the timeline. Uh, we conducted regional workshops with, uh, with the Rio Convention National Focal Points and FAO uh, staff in February. Uh, now in May, we are uh, conducting these regional workshops for, for all stakeholders. Uh, and then next week, we will open up a call uh, for um, requesting support uh, for national consultations. On, on land tenure and, and land restoration initiatives. Uh, we will then go to a, a selection process and then hopefully begin national consultations in late uh, 2020, late this year, uh, and then throughout 2024, taking us to COP16. I'd just like to um, bring to your attention um, the global mechanism, which is a, a, a unit of the UNCCD. Um, that uh, works directly at the national level and, and helps countries to translate their LDN targets and national drought plans into concrete projects and programs. So these, these transformative projects and programs, um, uh, we think uh, are, are very um, um, open uh, to uh, a gender uh, tenure, uh, uh, other, other issues that are very um, important um, for sustainability in the land use sector. Uh, in 2015, we, we started a target setting program uh, based on, on LDN, uh, and we have been working with over 130 countries. Uh, again, as I mentioned, over 100 have already set those targets, have produced technical documents, and um, have, have uh, obtained high level commitments high level political commitments, uh, whether those are integrated into legal frameworks or into uh, government policy. Uh, and then the, the, the rest of the, the graphic uh, shows that we, we are really um, uh, looking to have a, a collaborative effort because there are implementing partners, technical partners, civil society, NGOs, uh, as well as donors um, that are all involved in developing and, and financing um, these type of projects. Um, so the, the global mechanism is, is, we're working very closely with them uh, and they're developing a land tenure toolbox, which will focus on developing the business case. So making the value proposition for why tenure should be included in, in restoration initiatives. It also will develop a, a tenure checklist. Uh, and this, this checklist, has been um, very useful in the past with, in other processes, uh, providing specific guidance to project developers as well as donors. Uh, and, and then finally, the, the mapping of stakeholders and, and financing opportunities. Uh, and this will, this will help uh, countries identify uh, where some of those um, where some of those opportunities exist. Uh, 
so if you have any specific um, you know, business or economic uh, uh, cases or good practice examples, um, we would love to hear from you uh, and our colleagues um, will be uh, are listed here. Again, we're going to share all these PowerPoints with you so you can you can contact us um, uh, to to let us know and and to uh, submit your contribution. Uh, so with that, I, I will close and uh, I'll pass it back to Carolina. Thank you so much, Sasha. It was a very interesting presentation and I hope this can give us a better overview on what's happening. Uh, I will again encourage uh, our colleagues and our um, participants to make questions. We are monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions to Sasha or any of us, please just write this down and we will be answering this. If it's a very interesting question or if you have questions to more than one finalist, we can also read the questions at the end of Brad's presentation and we can have a short discussion. So our next um, presentation is from Brad Patterson. He is a colleague of mine. He works for the FIRO and he's a, a, an expert and specialist on lanternary and has been working with the FIRO for more than 10 years. And I think this is a very interesting uh, partnership that we have in the region because in my case, I'm the chief focal point and we have a very close relationship with our land tenery team. We, we managed to, under the last Jeff cycle, Jeff seven, we have activities, at least activities, in some cases even more, on land tenery in our, our Jeff projects. So this is creating a very good basis for the, the discussion in the region and I think is a very good uh, case to share also with other regions. So just, I think the point here is to make sure we coordinate different aspects of the land tenery because we need to really open this box. And the presentation of Brad is exactly that. So he presents the technical guide for the integration of the voluntary guidelines and land degradation of pilots. So Brad, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to you, Carolina. Um, yes, uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Brad Patterson. I'm a land tenure specialist uh, with FAO based in the regional office for Europe and Central Asia in, in Budapest, Hungary. And um, yes, uh, no, I agree. Thanks so much, Carolina. Um, I think the, the work and the partnership that, that we're building here is, um, uh, yeah, it could be an example um as we as we continue to push it forward so as as carolina as carolina mentioned uh i'll be presenting the technical guide um and just a reminder to everyone because we have been and, and we will be talking a lot about uh, tenure systems uh, land tenure uh, and i'm sure most participants have in-depth knowledge on this topic but I, i'd still like to give just a very simple definition because the concept is not always uh, well known. So the, the rules of, of tenure uh, determine who can use which resources for how long and under what conditions. So the, these rules, they, they could be based on, on written policies and laws, or uh, they can be also unwritten customs and practices. So whether we're talking about private ownership, lease rights, use rights, customary rights or systems of tenure, these rights and responsibilities are, are defined by tenure systems. Um, as mentioned by Sasha in the previous presentation, the technical guide was, uh, was published last year and is now available in, in multiple languages. The, the scope of the, of the guide is, is basically to provide uh, potential solutions to commonly encountered land tenure challenges in the context of national plans, legal frameworks, strategies, and action programs with regard to land degradation neutrality. The technical guide addresses policy and decision makers, making them aware of the potential and the means by which legitimate tenure rights and responsible governance of tenure can contribute 
to land degradation neutrality and restoration commitments. Now, it also strives sort of as a, as a secondary audience, uh, land administrators, uh, potential beneficiaries who participate in and are impacted by land degradation initiatives. And this can include uh, civil society organizations who are particularly supporting uh, vulnerable populations or um, indigenous peoples, uh, women, youth, local communities. Um, some of the key considerations in the guide include the notion of legitimate tenure rights, which includes all uh, existing tenure arrangements at the individual and community level, uh, irrespective of their formal recognition by the state. So a right to a natural resource can be considered legitimate, even if it has not been formalized. That's, that's, that's the notion of, of legitimate tenure rights. And it's a central concept of, um, of the voluntary guideline, the VGGT principles, as well as to, to the pathways uh, that will be described uh, uh, shortly. Uh, consultation and participation is another key consideration in the guide and um, multi-stakeholder platforms uh, can be a tool for participation and consultation uh, to build informed consent among different stakeholders. And of course, understanding the differences between women and men and taking measures to foster gender equality is, is crucial, uh, particularly when talking about and dealing with tenure systems, rights, uh, natural resources, the power relations that lie therein. Um, all of this needs a, uh, a gender responsive approach. Uh, a quick background on, on the, the voluntary guidelines uh, on responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forests in the context of national food security. Uh, they were developed through an extensive, inclusive, and participatory process and endorsed by the Committee on World Food Security, which is a, an international and inter, intergovernmental platform. Uh, this, they were endorsed in May of 2012. And, and the VGGT, essentially, they, they, they serve as a reference and set out uh, principles and internationally accepted standards for practice for the responsible governance of tenure. Uh, you can think of it as it, it, they provide a framework that states can use when developing their own strategies, policies, legislation. Uh, and it also allows governments, but also civil society, private sector, uh, citizens of a, of a country to judge whether their proposed actions or the actions of others constitute acceptable practices. Um, and the, the technical guide on the integration of the VGT and land degradation neutrality is designed to provide guidance through two sets of pathways, uh, universal and context specific. There are nine pathways in total, and the universal pathways can be applied to all land degradation neutrality initiatives for all the drivers of land degradation and all, all tenure types. The universal, the universal pathways relate to policy and legal frameworks, uh, policy coordination mechanisms, securing women's tenure rights and access to natural resources, as well as uh, grievance and dispute resolution mechanisms. The context specific pathways depend on, well, exactly that, the, the context. Um, so this could include, uh, for example, specific country situations or situations pertaining to certain subnational regions, uh, land uses, or groups. Um, the, the context specific pathways focus on integrated land use planning that is participatory and tenure responsive, supporting land degradation neutrality through land administration tools. The examples in the guide are about uh, land consolidation and land banking. And finally, pathways dedicated to tenure rights on public lands, on commons, and on private land. Um, 
you might be thinking, okay, nine pathways, uh, which one do I take? There are so many. Um, well, he, here is a, an infographic taken from the technical guide. I'm not going to go over it in detail, but it essentially it's just to show that it, it encapsulates all the pathways and it shows some of the preliminary assessments that should be made in socioeconomic and biophysical areas uh, so that countries and communities can identify which pathway is most relevant for them. Um, later in, the, in this webinar, we have two excellent uh, country case studies. Um, so here I'd, I'd like to briefly highlight an example of uh, land consolidation to support sustainable land management in North Macedonia. And, and this particular example refers to pathway six um, from the context specific pathways, which is supporting land degradation neutrality through land administration tools. So very briefly, land consolidation is a tool to adjust uh, property structures in rural areas, uh, usually farms or land parcels that are used for agricultural production. Uh, it's, and it's done through a, a comprehensive reallocation of, of parcels. And it's coordinated between landowners and land users. And the reason, or one of the reasons it, this tool is employed is to reduce land fragmentation, to facilitate uh, enlargement of farms, uh, but also to achieve other public objectives, uh, such as nature restoration or, or infrastructure construction. FAO has been supporting land consolidation in North Macedonia for many years, and it's one of the few countries in the region with a, uh, an operational national land consolidation program. Uh, so the average farm in North Macedonia is around 1.9 hectares in size, and on average, the farm has 5.8 land parcels. So you can imagine a situation where someone uh, owns or uh, has access to, to land in a farm, but there's, uh, the, the, the plots are spread out over five or six or 10 different uh, places. Um, and uh, so, so land consolidation can help reduce the number of parcels, uh, make them more uh, regularly shaped if, if the if the shape is not sort of conducive for agricultural production, and it can also enlarge the sizes of farm. So on, on this slide, the image on, on the right um, uh, is of a land consolidation project area in Egri village in North Macedonia. The, the left side of the image shows uh, land plot boundaries before land consolidation, and on the right after land, land consolidation. So you can see that the number of of parcels has been reduced and the average parcel size is, is larger. It might be a little bit difficult to see, but you can, you can see there are much fewer lines indicating the boundaries. So in addition to consolidating the land um, in Egri, there were also infrastructure improvements done to irrigation, ir irrigation to drainage and, to, and access to the land parcels through uh, access roads. So this doesn't only contribute to um, better agricultural productivity and efficiency, but it also makes farms more resilient to extreme weather conditions such as floods and droughts. Um, it's expected and it's encouraged and it's hoped that many of the, of the farmers will invest in, in further improvements to their farms on top of the public uh, investments. And um, so, so this is an example of land consolidation that can support land degradation neutrality initiatives by facilitating environmental protection, improving farm structures, and importantly, uh, diminishing production costs to uh, facilitate sustainable land management adoption. Uh, okay, the, um, the, the key messages from, from the technical guide um, are, are here. Uh, just two, two more slides. So uh, secure tenure increases positive impact of land degradation neutrality initiatives for planet um, by addressing tenure in, in land degradation neutrality initiatives. It begins with the assessment of local needs and conditions. And as mentioned before, uh, meaningful and inclusive consultation is, is vital uh, throughout the process. Um, gender responsive approaches 
uh, address underlying inequalities in control and access to the land resources, um, awareness raising and sharing of lessons learned on responsible land governance enhances dialogue, partnerships, and mutual learning. And, and finally, but also very important, that data and indicators on land governance are currently limited in scope, uh, but these are essential for uh, understanding the problem, tracking progress, and identifying gaps. Uh, so that's that's the presentation on the technical guide. Um, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks very much, and back to you, Carolina. Thank you so much, Brett. So now we will try again the, the wording count that we have uh, a bit of technical issues at the beginning. So we are going to have the, the link on the chat. Um, so the link is available. So I will ask you to, to click and start adding the words so you can start to see the wording counting. And so what are the words you think when you hear Lentenary? So I would like to ask all the participants to go to the link and add the words and enter. So you can see that things are coming. Okay, interesting. You give two more minutes, so please add your words and click enter. Okay, and less chance. Okay, we're still getting some. Okay. So I think it's very interesting the results we are starting to get. I think we can see two bigger words at the center. It's ownership and security. But also we have rights. Okay, now rights is coming bigger. And the word community is coming also. And we have sustainability, control, um, community, social justice. And now we cannot read because the words are going out. Land rights. So I think we can stop. So if everybody has a word, please press enter. And Let's consider this our final wording. No, it's not our final. Okay, so I will ask our colleagues that to stop the, the word counting. So now that's our final results. <laughs> not yet. Uh, but you don't have a lot of change from now. We have uh, the center is to ownership, rights, security, sustainability, and community. But also we can see the word control coming there. Uh, 
and security of forest areas come quite strong. So this brings us attention for the, the importance of this topic in the region. But then on the ads of this word encountering, we can see right use, sensitive issue, which is quite interesting. What are use rights? Okay, this is a very important topic. And the discussion on water governance is something that now FAO is also putting a lot of attention. And this was uh, a very important topic that we discussed in the informal consultation for the European Commission on Agriculture. So this will be a very important topic and we can see this coming here as well. But then we have increased productivity with our main goal, I would say, to have a more sustainable productivity, but at the same time respecting people and respecting the communities, governance, forestry. So I think uh, responsibility is also it's an important topic that has moved a little bit and how has like a bit more attention. So um, this is a quite interesting word counting and this is a very interesting exercise that we can understand how many different aspects we have when we hear lanternary and also how complex this topic is. So this was just an icebreaker. We can bring it back at the end, and, but you also you have this uh, image when you see the video and I think it can be very interesting to use this as a, a discussion and a starting discussion point because you can see how complex and sensitive the, the topic is. So now I give the floor to our next presenter. So we are going to have a presentation from Beth Hobart. She is the director for the Center for Women's Land Rights, which is a very important topic. And she is a uh, work with policy and gender. And she has focused her work on strengthening the um, a more inclusive and equal um, land rights to land and natural resource having women at the center. So how we can assure that when you have policies and you have actions, you can benefit equally men and women, which can be sometimes very challenging. So she's a gender expert. She leads the team on gender expert and specialists across the organization. Uh, Center for Women Lands Rights, which is a very important organization that has a very strong partnership and a very important role in all the discussion we are having today. So I think I, she can speak for herself. I have a very long bio, but you know, after this presentation, I think you have a very clear vision on how important and how meaningful the work she's developing at Landesa. It, it you it is so. Beth, over to you. Thank you so much, Carolina, for that very warm welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. I'm going to share my presentation with you all. Are you all able to see my screen? Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar with Landessa, uh, Landessa is an international land rights organization. Uh, we are currently active in, uh, have offices and active projects in Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as uh, regional and global advocacy efforts, including our partnership with the UNCCD on awareness raising for the intersection between land, land degradation neutrality and land tenure. And so I'm, I'm 
It's my pleasure to present today on um, the options paper that Sasha uh, provided a, a bit of overview for earlier. So again, this was requested um, alongside the technical guide at COP14 and then was presented at COP15 and adopted at COP15 alongside the technical guide as well. Um, and so I'm going to provide an overview of the, the options paper for awareness raising, just give a little bit more detail um, beyond the, the outline that Sasha provided earlier, and then give just some very brief examples of um, from our work in Bangladesh, and then a, a quick example from Pakistan, uh, just highlighting the linkages between women's land tenure in particular and um, land degradation neutrality. So we'll start with an overview of the awareness raising paper. Uh, so again, this, uh, this paper uh, is focused on the role of effective awareness raising in, in supporting LDN initiatives. So uh, an appropriate framing might be that in, it's a complement to the, the technical nature of the, uh, the VGGT and LDN guide. This is really focused on the, the political and uh, interpersonal social relationship uh, nature of land. Uh, so when we when we saw the word cloud, we we noted words like complicated, uh, power dynamics. Um, we, we all know that land is a sensitive and difficult issue, and particularly when it comes to effectively integrating land governance um, and addressing the issues of um, climate change and land degradation neutrality and, and addressing in the midst of that, the power dynamics that are endemic in uh, often preventing equitable land tenure um, and preventing the implementation of effective land governance that, in, that enables effective LDN initiatives. Um, so awareness raising depends on equitable representation and leadership of vulnerable groups um, in those awareness raising efforts. So making sure that from implementation, from design of LDN initiatives through their implementation at all levels of engagement, the groups that will benefit from and participate in these initiatives are present. And so to ensure this representation and leadership uh, we must understand their perspectives and, and account for the power dynamics between dominant groups and vulnerable groups, and then address those power dynamics in order for their participation to be meaningful and inclusive. Um, so that's addressing power dynamics between government entities and communities, between private sector actors, and development partners, civil society actors at the national level, grassroots organizations at the at the the local level, and thinking about vulnerable groups in terms of um, different axes of marginalization. So the the awareness raising paper addresses uh, women, um, indigenous peoples, and local communities youth, pastoralists, migrants, and persons with disabilities. So recognizing that that's not a, a comprehensive set, um, but it is the, the official and, and broad scope that the UNCCD has adopted. So encouraging uh, partners to think through uh, that set of, of vulnerable groups and to, to think through how to address the needs of those vulnerable groups in, in their particular context. And then recognizing that successful awareness raising is is necessitates strong partnerships as well as investments of investment of resources and requires building on the existing foundation of the global agendas that uh, that we're talking through so uh, the the strength of of the UNCCD frameworks uh, the strength of the VGGT and the best practices and ongoing initiatives that that come from those frameworks um, so this, this awareness raising process has started uh, from COP15, but we need to, to carry forward um, with all of you the, the needed actions to really engage and mobilize um, actors at all level to, to make sure that, uh, that, these, that the needed actions for um, LDN and tenure integration uh, take place. So Sasha already gave a quick overview of these four effective steps. So I'll, get, I'll just give a little bit of quick detail. Um, so for step one, drafting an action plan. Again, this is, this is 
evaluating the context and then choosing from a range of options. So this could include um, hosting conferences, hosting a series of consultations at, at a variety of levels to build awareness with different stakeholders, um, developing locally relevant, relevant skits to be played on uh, television or radio or to be presented live in communities, uh, creating a decision tree uh, for which, you know, which choices might be appropriate within a particular context. Um, so for step two, identifying and partnering with target audiences. Um, so here, it, there is guidance within this, this options paper for different types of stakeholders to think through who are they raising awareness with and what are they raising awareness for and how can they integrate a gender equality and social inclusion approach, tailoring the design of those awareness raising activities to reach and to meaningfully include all of those audiences as partners and key knowledge holders in the process of implementation of LDN initiatives integrated with tenure. And there's also a checklist provided in this step uh, for uh, including, for uh, encouraging and enabling inclusion and partnership. Um, step three is adopting key messaging. So stakeholders can uh, select from high messaging, high level messaging options that are presented. There's also guidance that's uh, provided for how to draft context specific messaging on awareness raising, how to address uh, what can be the most relevant issues at that nexus of tenure uh, and land degradation, and as well as communication tips. Um, so some of the sample messages for, uh, for for example, our secure land tenure rights encourage sustainable land investments and good land stewardship, or secure tenure provides, provides a foundation for lasting solutions for life on land. So really providing stakeholders with the links between tenure and uh, restoration of land and livelihoods, for example. And then finally, step four is about evaluating uh, the successes and challenges from the messaging and awareness raising approaches and learning from those successes and challenges and adapting the strategy. So um, enabling forward progress on what will work to um, enable tenure implementation and to enable inclusion in that ten tenure implementation. Um, and so allowing stakeholders to, this, this section allows stakeholders to choose uh, sample indicators in developing a monitoring and evaluation strategy. So next slide here. So again, in, in addressing um, uh, awareness raising, we want to encourage stakeholders to take a gender equality and social in inclusion approach. So this is, um, and, and other speakers have mentioned this, Brad did a great job of talking through the importance of identifying uh, gender responsive approaches and understanding power dynamics. Um, so some of the considerations and steps that are suggested for applying a contextualized and an intersectional approach um, are to identify the communities that are vulnerable within the geographic context. So again, recognizing these six groups within, within the framework provided, um, but looking for who is disproportionately experiencing tenure insecurity and inequality, um, so including, including land, landless agricultural laborers, for example, uh, women and gender minorities, uh, youth, and, and looking for uh, what, are the, what are the groups that are most likely to be experiencing this exclusion and least likely to be included in interventions for land degradation neutrality. And then second is to include intersectionality of identity to recognize that people are part of more than one group at a time. So women within a cooperative working on land restoration might be uh, part of an ethnic minority. Some of them may be divorced, some of them may not, and they're going to experience uh, access to land differently and access to information about land degradation neutrality differently, depending on those intersectional identities. And then third, considering specific challenges and needs of disenfranchised communities and individuals uh, within these target audiences. Um, so cultural norms, language differences. 
And finally, fourth, considering power dynamics between groups. So this is really key, of course. So understanding how uh, dominant groups and vulnerable groups will be, uh, will interact with each other and, and mapping out those power dynamics and thinking of how to address representation and making sure voices are heard. So I'll move on quickly to, um, to, I know I'm out of time, so I'll just highlight our quickly our work in Stand for Her Land uh, in Bangladesh. So Stand for Her Land is a global advocacy campaign, and we're partnering with the, the Her Land campaign that the UNCCD has, has launched as well. So um, Stand for Her Land, this, the global advocacy initiative is focused on empowering grassroots um, organizations and particularly women-led organizations to advocate for implementation of tenure security. And particularly in Bangladesh, uh, we're aligning uh, the approaches on tenure security in coastal areas and agricultural land uh, with LDN targets that have been established by the Bangladeshi government. So in, in this arena, we're really focused on awareness raising around tenure and then connecting that to policy advocacy and policy cohesion to enable that link between LDN and land tenure security. And I will actually leave it there as I know I'm running over a little bit. Um, so thank you all so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you tonight and would really welcome um, any questions or any follow up from folks. Back to you, Carolina. Thank you so much, but I think it is, is clear how important is the work that they are doing. And for me, when you don't look at men and women as a whole, we are just addressing half of the problem. So if you don't have this uh, sensibility, this gender sensitive uh, approach, we address half of the problem because women, we are half of the population. So that's why the, import, the, the importance of the work that Landesa and Beth are doing, it's so, so unique. And thank you for sharing your experience. And I really encourage our participants here to send questions, comments to our panelists, um, because this is a topic that we really need to explore a bit more. People who knows me know that the gender and the discussions is at the core of my work. And uh, I can see when you have really gender lens when you're de designing, especially because my role is to designing projects. When you look at these at first the beginning, you can really make some very important change in the process. So thank you so much. <laughs> So let's move to our next presentation. We are a little behind of time, but not too much. So let's see if we can catch up a little bit. We are going to have a presentation with three amazing panelists now. So I just give them their names and I let them introduce themselves because the work they are doing is on sharing information, which is very important. So the presentation is the role of data and information in supporting the global land degradation neutrality agenda. So it's how we can aggregate data and make sure every, all the information is available for everybody. So the first uh, speaker will be Laura Mejolaro, I guess. I'm so sorry for the a better accent or misspelling, mispronouncing your name. So she's the managing director of the Land uh, Portal Foundation. Uh, where we can find a lot of very useful information for people who work with land degradation at Valencia. The second speaker will be Eva Ershaw, and she works with data and land monitoring. So she's from the International Land Coalition, also another very important partner for this agenda and this connection between land degradation and land tenure. And the last speaker will be Elvira Maratova. Uh, she works with pasture community development. So she also works uh, in the monitoring and evaluation aspect of this topic. So let's start. And Laura, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for introducing me. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for having 
um, in this um, excellent um, um, series of, of webinars on these important uh, issues of the relationship between land degradation, neutrality, and um, tenure. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Laura, and uh, I'm um, the managing director of the Land Portal um, uh, Foundation which is um, a small uh, Dutch uh, NGO that has been um, very active over the last uh, 15 years to um, advocate for and work towards a more um, open and uh, data ecosystem um, and to improve um, um, access to uh, data and information related to land. Um, if we look at this particular um, um, of this particular set of uh, data, so the 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 the, the relationship, you not know, these two issues, the relationship between degradation and uh, tenure, again, is um, quite a complex um, relationship, um, and and as a as a result, you know, the uh, the data ecosystem. Um, around it is is also uh, very complex uh, uh, to to understand. Um, well, the, the, there is a consensus, you know, that the big uh, portion of of the of the global soils is is already degraded, and the situation will become worse and worse, uh, spiking up to towards almost ninety percent by twenty fifty. This is what scientists uh, are telling us. Um, and and of course, the, if we think that uh, uh, this will be combined with other stressors such as population growth or increased urbanization or migration, um, I we we easily um, derive that uh, you know, the, um, the, the 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 existing uh, crisis will be uh, amplified, become one major driver for for social and political instability, which will most probably lead to conflict, food insecurity, and migration. So it's really a crisis. If we look both at the reasons and, and, and the consequences of land degradation, we see a very strong relationship with the way that land resources, land and water resources are managed uh, and, and, and are also used, but also are governed. Um, and in fact, land degradation um, might be an effect of, 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 of course, of the, the, the change, the climate change, but research has also shown that uh, is increasingly caused by directly or indirectly by unsustainable human uh, land activities, such as unsustainable governance, uh, use and management of land. So the examples show um, one, one example, for instance, uh, of, of a one tenure uh, decision that might affect uh, um, um, land degradation is, for instance, when uh, land is uh, the, the excessive fragmentation of land forces herders, not to smaller areas, and accelerates uh, degradation due to overgrazing is an example. Another example is when um, uh, unsustainable investment you know, in commercial agriculture that involves monoculture again, um, leads, to, um, leads to degradation of, of, the, um, of the soil, or in some, some cases, the lack of, of policy. You know? For instance, when uh, unplanned or unregulated urbanization or deforestation um, uh, you know, put, uh, give land you know, to um, uh, mining or, or um, privatization or, or uh, speculation that destroy you know, biodiversity and, and lead to desertification or the straining of, of land and water resources um, and increasing in greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So uh, in, other, in other cases, you know, the, the lack of uh, ownership of the land resources discourage groups and communities and people in investing in, in soil conservation or, or agroforestry, for example, or, or uh, on the other hand, a, a, the, the degradation of, of the um, of the soil uh, also disrupts you know, the, the agrarian and pastoral systems, uh, undermining um, the water energy food nexus that is so critical you know, for for rural nomadic livelihoods. Um, another example uh, is you know, of, of this this dual uh, relationship that affect negatively you no know, degradation and tenure is, for instance, the. Um, 
the situation of communal of, of indigenous and forest communities. No, our um, um, study found out that, for instance, in a number of emerging economy countries, thirty one percent of the area included in timber mining and agriculture concessions overlap with communal land, um, local communal land. So, and if you think that indigenous peoples usually uh, legally own a small fraction uh, of the land that they manage, you can easily derive how, um, the, what are the vulnerability uh, factors here, no, in, in both directions. So in um, such a, a complex uh, and fragmented uh, data landscape, what are the major uh, data challenges? Well, a land, um, um, the, 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 the influence, no, um, the, the way um, the, the data is collected uh, and used by whom, et cetera. So the, the, co the complex um, relationship no, um, between climate, you know, land degradation and tenure, or, or more broadly between climate and, and land governance, demonstrates you know, that the, the way development partners you know, um, see land um, make it a really a cross-cutting and multi-dimensional issue. Now, this is also um, true for, for, for other uh, uh, big um, topics, no? land seats in climate and environment and environment agenda, but also in the food security and agriculture or economic and development and investment or governance and rights. So it's, it's part of usually you know, a broader uh, and influence uh, broader uh, agenda. So, what does it mean in terms of data? It means that it's very also, data is usually complex uh, to put together and, and correlate, you know, because they are disaggregated um, across uh, different um, agencies. So in this case, for instance, you know, whereas measuring biophysical data is usually uh, done quite well, there are quite sophisticated, impressive uh, tools, um, although also you know, the, 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 the way the, it, it also implies you know, different um, uh, land degradation can, can, can be the result of many social, economic, uh, environmental drivers, and which also has to be taken into consideration. But the real, real challenge comes when we want to correlate you know, biophysical uh, data of the soil, you know, the ground with, with the tenure data. Um, and um, here, we, again, we, we observe another challenge. You know, there is a different um, conceptual framework you know, behind uh, this type of data, you know, whereas usually um, land degradation um, projects and, 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 and data are really related to uh, uh, smaller subnational areas and, and are short term land governance, usually the land governance uh, data and programs are, are usually longer term and, 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 and nationwide. So it's not very easy, to, again, to correlate. Um, but, but the big problem, what really the land portal is advocating uh, has been advocated for many years and, and we put the focus on is, um, yes, data is fragmented, is dispersed uh, across different data points, different databases, making it very difficult to, to, to have a, a, a clear picture. Institutions are producing information in, in silos, no? and, and uh, according to their uh, mandates, you know, to their needs, it's difficult to have a, a, a conversation um, around um, the real um, needs. But is, is on the top of that, in many cases, uh, data is also um, um, not published in the right way. So in, in, may, in many cases, data is incomplete, close, inaccessible, and, and it's not interoperable. Um, they, they, they do not use the right metadata. So it's very difficult to aggregate, to analyze, um, also to, to scrutinize, sometimes to, to, to see it, to find it online. So as a result, um, the discussions you know, remain uncoordinated and, um, and happening you know, within silos. And, um, and also the 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 the, the efforts, you know, that is in the investment, you know, that is being made in collecting 
collecting data, but the real needs, not the real challenges, the real um, issues that data should should be used to you not know, to solve. Uh, um, yeah, they, they, there is a, a disconnection, uh, a disconnection there. So um, that's why the the, the, the LAN portal um, in this uh, no we we see data and information not an end in itself. We we see data and information as an enabler you know, for a more equitable and environmentally sustainable governance. Uh, that address land degradation. And we see open data as a critical, critical factor, open ecosystems that promote data as a public good, really, really necessary condition uh, to support decisions and drive uh, policy that put people back at the center. So as a, uh, that's why we, 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 we don't stop to really advocate for open, inclusive and democratic and high quality information and data on land governance that seek to drive uh, progress in three main directions. No? Uh, so we want to support actions that help information providers and, and governments make data more open and accessible as part of their mandate. Uh, I mean, this, this is the mandate uh, of, of government. In most cases, data is not really considered a public good uh, yet. Um, secondly, it's really important to engage stakeholders into constructive and inclusive dialogue and conversation around data. So find a common language because everyone speaks a different language and, and really um, concentrates you know, in, in their own specific uh, activities and build data alliances within and beyond the sector. And I think this crisis uh, really demonstrates that we really need to look beyond um, beyond the land sector um, and and try to to elevate land in 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 other agendas. So um, as as an example, now together with the Open Data Charter, the Open Government Partnership, you now the Global Data Barometer, we are trying to really um, drive um, an open data movement. You now that develop a set of tools and resources for measuring, documenting, assessing and ultimately improving the state uh, of land data at the national and, and global level. So just to conclude, um, in, the, in a situation of lack of awareness of benefits of open data, poor technical capacity uh, and data literacy, insufficient legal frameworks that support an inclusive data governance, and a lack of political uh, incentives to enable co cooperative data sharing, these partnerships uh, uh, launched this uh, open land data uh, program that really has a set of resources that goes in the direction of uh, making data uh, on land more accessible and, 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 uh, and usable. So whereas the state of land information reports and the state of land information index help mapping you know, and measuring, assessing how open uh, land information is, and so find entry points for action. The Open Up Guide is more a tool uh, for um, advancing conversations about uh, open data uh, with national authorities, you know, but also uh, major data custodians and, and development partners, um, as well as uh, areas where donors should invest you know, to improve national land uh, information systems, or where private uh, and public sector could uh, really come together, or, or, or civil society and government come together to improve the quality and the quantity and accessibility uh, of land data. So shared data and information are really fundamental uh, to mainstreaming climate actions and providing coordinated and, and a coherent response to climate change across government and society. Thank you for your attention. So now we're going to turn to Eva, who's going to give a presentation. Eva, you have the floor. Great, thank you. Let me 
start this and tell me if you don't see my presentation. It's um, a pleasure to be here today. And really, as ILC, we're really pleased to be part of this thinking about how land tenure can be better integrated into the UNCCD work and framework. Um, the, the toolkit is, is already an important advancement, and we've, we've just been really impressed by the thinking and experiences sharing um, in these series of webinars. So um, my name is Eva Hershaw. I'm the Global land, uh, land Monitoring and Data Lead at the International Land Coalition. We are a coalition of more than 300 members. We work across 84 countries, and our members work with an estimated 70 million land users. Um, what we, uh, what the work that I focus on at ILC and, and the reason that we're here today um, is 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 an effort to build people's data and indicators that we think can provide for a more nuanced and inclusive understanding of some key issues in land governance. Um, we've been working with our members over the past four years to build um, indicators, to build data collection methodologies that we then can help our members use in order to hold governments, to hold corporations um, accountable while monitoring major frameworks. So um, we've we've also entered this space as a partner in the UN decade. It's been a couple of years since we've been working with um, platforms. You'll hear from our platform in Asia um, just after me, but we're, we're co-leading challenge 5.1 of the decade, um, the UN decade of restoration. And <clears throat> that focuses on the links between tenure security and restoration. So we're, we're doing that, as I said, with ILC's Asia platform on ecosystem restoration, as well as our Semiaridos platform that you heard from yesterday. When we talk about data and what data is needed to understand our potential for restoration and to mitigate land degradation, we have already three key SDGs that point us in the right direction. We have an SDG on um, land degradation, 1531, and we have two SDGs that look at different aspects of land tenure. We have 142, which measures the rates of documentation and perceived tenure security. We also have 5A1, which tells tells us the proportion of agricultural land that's in the hands of women. Um, we also know that in order to have a, an, a, a more complete understanding of restoration potential and the potential to, of a country to, to mitigate land degradation, we need to look at other indicators. There are other indicators that exist and data sources that can tell us quite a bit. Um, it's important to understand what the legal framework provides for. Um, in terms of ownership, diverse types of tenure. 5A2 is another SDG indicator that gives us a gendered perspective that tells us the strength of the legal framework to provide for women's land rights. Um, we also need to look at what bundle of rights IPs, indigenous peoples, and local communities enjoy in the country. To what extent can they control land and exclude others? This is an indicator of potential for community-led restoration. Whether or not free prior and informed consent is embedded in the laws and applied, um, does decision making involve land users and is are these programs following a human rights based approach? These are other indicators, questions we can ask, things we can measure in order to understand potential for restoration and where policies, programs may need to be adapted. Um, we know that if we limit ourselves to official data, the indicators that have been defined through the SDGs, that data is limited. It continues to not show us well key populations such as indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, we also need to look at diverse data sources to cover these gaps and to create openings for citizen generated complementary data. We've seen frameworks slowly opening to this kind of data and recognizing their potential. We need to encourage that also in the framework of UNCCD's work um, in order to better understand these links to restoration. Um, I'm giving a quick example from the Philippines. This is data that we've generated through Landex. Landex is our land, our global land governance index. Um, 
On three levels, we measure um, local control of land and ecosystems. We have a number of other indicators, but zeroing in on a couple of them. We know that in the Philippines, for example, the government has made a clear commitment to LDN and has set targets. Um, local participatory management of land is included in national laws, policies, or programs. Um, we know that of the total rural administrative districts in the Philippines, 39% of them have sustainable use plans. And we know also that those living on community land in the Philippines are far less secure. 11% of those surveyed reported feeling secure compared to 57% across the rural Philippines on average. This is PRINDEX data. And again, acts as an indicator of our um, potential for community-led restoration and the prevention of land degradation. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to improve data interoperability. If we're going to work with SDG data, data coming from other sources, we need to find a way to make it speak to each other, to streamline it, to make it digestible, create openings for diverse data sources, and build processes for citizen-led and people's data to contribute to these. Um, also consider that LDN um, restoration are going to rely on multiple and enabling factors. Um, and with that, I would pass to one of ILC's members, Elvira, who is working in our Asia Rangelands platform and is going to share her specific experience there from Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. And over to, uh, the, over to you, Elvira. Thank you, Eva. Hi, everyone. I'm joining you from Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And today I'm going to share, share our case study from my country. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Um, can I start? Okay, this one. So uh, here in Kyrgyzstan, we have um, this um, one of the major uh, laws uh, that called law, law on pastures. So it was, I was involved in this process from the scratch and we have done a huge job actually. Uh, it was started in 2009 uh, and uh, today we have very uh, impressive at the national level results, but there is so many things to do ahead. So I will share the process from the uh, beginning. So what the factors of land degradation in Kyrgyzstan? So uh, from my experience, we face, uh, first of all, it's natural factors. So uh, my country is based on the high mountain area and we see the uh, very uh, huge pressure of climate change and uh, all the uh, results of this process. So we see that we face uh, foil er land erosion and land degradation and we see the uh, so many uh, problems like desertification and loss of uh, productivity of these lands. And also one of the key factors is the uh, uh, improper agricultural practices that was used uh, during the last 30 years. So we see that um, lands which are placed near the villages uh, using for grazing, overusing for grazing, and we see very, uh, they are in a very bad condition for today. And also uh, the next factor is deforestation. It's uh, unpredictable and uncontrolled uh, cutting on the trees in the forest during the first uh, five, 10 years of the independence of the country. So we see that um, people didn't understand that uh, there, there, there was no uh, any framework for the management of the forest lands. So uh, the process was uh, Hyotic, let's say. And the next um, factor is urbanization. Of course, we see the migration processes in the country and we see increased pressure on the agricultural lands, uh, especially near the big cities. And the last thing is, is social economical uh, factors, the, like poverty and uh, low difference of uh, uh, job opportunities and et, et cetera. Um, so uh, I want to highlight uh, four uh, 
main land tenure gaps in the country. First of all, it was insecure land rights. So uh, after the independence of the country in 1991, uh, we, we faced that we don't have uh, any clear laws uh, that uh, clarify the rights of local population, of local communities, and how to use this uh, lands, how to manage even who own this land. So it was not clear. and. Uh, ma many, many uh, small uh, fragmented land ownership presented in the rural areas uh, uh, didn't allow to manage uh, these lands in proper way and to plan it uh, or even to uh, create the opportunities to restore it. And also uh, displacement and migra migration, as I mentioned it. Many young people, they moved to the big cities and even to abroad. So we couldn't uh, uh, effectively manage and transfer these lands uh, between the generations. Uh, and it was very uh, unclear how to uh, do it in, this, in the current uh, legislation framework in the country. And of course, it leads to the conflicts uh, on the land use. So we had uh, three or four um, big conflicts between the regions uh, on the pasture use. Uh, it was very unexpected, but uh, it was not, uh, it, it, actually it was based on the not clear legislation at the time on the uh, land tenure system in the country. So, kind of uh, solutions we had. Uh, it was first of all the pasture reforms that we have started in uh, 2009, as I mentioned it. Uh, all uh, rights uh, of management that used uh, of pasture lands were transferred to the local communities so they could uh, uh, plan these uh, areas, uh, plan the management. So uh, uh, based on the community-based land management uh, was uh, based on the groups of local uh, villagers who were united in the uh, 454 uh, pasture committees. So they, uh, uh, so each village has its own committee and they could plan for a short-term period like one year and long-term uh, initiatives like five or 10 years. So uh, the main idea was to um, arrange the proper rotation of these lands and create the opportunities for the ecosystem restorations according to these plans. And of course, part of this, it was land tenure awareness and education, which we have done in almost in each of 454 villages in the country. So it was a huge job. And uh, if we are talking about the challenges, I want to highlight five or six main challenges that we are facing today. It's the limited institutional capacity, uh, complex land tenure systems, uh, land use conflicts, limited uh, engagement and funding and resource constraints. And of course, the big one global is the climate change impact. So what do we see uh, as a positive consequences and uh, outcomes of these implemented uh, pasture reforms in our country? First of all, it was uh, the uh, main idea of this process is sustainable uh, land management. And we see uh, the reduced land use conflict because tenure rights are more or less clear now. And we have uh, documented this process and every owner of this land uh, uh, they have their documents and they can uh, unite, they can share this land, so it's uh, more or less clear now. And uh, as a result, we see improved, improved environmental conservation, um, enhanced community resilience and economic development opportunities. So we see that uh, our efforts uh, uh, led to the uh, creation, creating the uh, more clear uh, and uh, sustainable and fair uh, framework for the land users. So uh, my last slide is about lessons learned uh, from this process. We, want, uh, we see that uh, it's very important to uh, engage uh, all parts, all stakeholders in the process of uh, planning and uh, using this um, lens. Uh, uh, and uh, the second is strengthening institutional capacity. So it's very important uh, to make the people who make decision 
uh, to give them uh, all the information. So these decisions could be very uh, uh, based on their experience and on the current legis legislation. Third is integration of traditional knowledge uh, and the whole process of pasture reforms in the country was based on the uh, traditions of the country. So uh, uh, using this traditional uh, transfer of these uh, grazing lands from the one generation to another uh, during the last 100 or 200 years, uh, in particular villages, it was the basis for dividing these communities in the pasture committees. So it was very effective because uh, people usually they um, respect their traditions and they acknowledge them and uh, based on this uh, the process make became more smoother and more proper in that uh, situation and uh, uh, next one is long-term commitment and funding yeah, uh, I mean uh, if the community itself has the long-term plans so, so the villagers the uh, rural community members they are very committed to this place because they have uh, prepared these plans and they uh, they are feel themselves as a, as a part of this process uh, and the, the the last one was uh, uh, this uh, lessons learned that we have to adapt uh, all our best practices to the uh, impact of climate change. Of course, we see it uh, in, all our, in all our countries, uh, but particularly in the mountain areas, uh, we can see it every year. And even me, I live in the capital of my country, but even me, I feel this uh, impact uh, on me, on my family, uh, in the, uh, in, in my partners in the rural areas. So thank you very much. It was the case from uh, Kyrgyzstan, and I hope uh, it was useful in the framework of these webinars, and I'm ready to answer if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avira. So I'd like to thank our last three speakers, Eva, Laura, and Avira, for giving us different uh, aspects of the same problem. We are slightly behind the, our schedule, but I think we can catch up. Uh, we should have a uh, questions and answer session now. And as most of the questions in the chat, they are being answered. Uh, you will make it very short. I would like just to bring uh, attention to one topic that was mentioned a few times on the chat about social justice. And we also saw this discussion uh, when you have the word in count, so the connection between land tenure and social justice it should be at the core of any kind of activity. I think Elvira brings a lot of color to this discussion on the importance of respecting the local and the way that they are used to use the land and how we, we develop the policies. Um, Kyrgyzstan is a, pastor, a pastoralist country and to give us a bit more color on the same problem, we are going to have a presentation on how we are implementing the voluntary guidelines in Mongolia, which is also a, a very strong pastoralist and nomadic country. So I think these two countries, they share some similarities, but they also share a very difficult challenging on how we assure the tenure of land if you move from one region to another. So I would like to invite Madame Gerau, Jan Sanjave. I so I'm so sorry, but I will call you Nara because it's the short version and the nickname that you, you like. Um, Nara is a executive director of uh, NGO called People Center Conservation. It's an NGO based in Mongolia. And they are playing a very important role in the implementation of the voluntary guidelines and they are working with different stakeholders in the country. And she's currently supporting the implementation called Women's Land Tenure Security. And again, we are bringing this discussion on the importance of gender, land tenure, and natural resource management, which is one of the points of our discussion today, and I would say one of the most challenging ones to assure a proper implementation. So, Nara, without overdue, please, the floor is yours. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, thank you for your, for introducing me. So I don't need to introduce myself again. Yeah, thank you, every, uh, thank you everyone for your attention and uh, not finishing my presentation. <laughs> but it's actually after three, uh, you know, like presentation, yes, kind of sometimes we lose our attention. Anyway, I was uh, mostly focused on the implementation in of EGT in Mongolia and key outcomes briefly. And uh, mostly I will uh, uh, talk about the practical ground application of uh, VGGT principles to improve dry land ecosystem governance in Mongolia. So those who are not uh, really familiar about Mongolia, Mongolia locates in the heart of Asia, center of Asia, and one of the most sparsely located uh, uh, sparsely populated country with only 3.4 million people in this huge land. But we have, you know, the livestock and the livestock number is 80 million. So with this, I uh, want to give you a brief uh, introduction or brief, uh, briefly, brief, want to briefly talk about the barriers and challenges we are facing to manage this dry land ecosystem. So 90% of the entire land and ecosystem of Mongolia is prone to desertification and uh, poor dry land governance associated with this. And again, this uh, safeguarding of the legitimate human rights of herders are not really recognized and uh, safeguarded and uh, unregulated and overuse of natural resources. In my previous slide, I said, uh, maybe you saw this, 80 million livestock, and these guys are making trouble, but mostly unregulated uh, because of these unregulated uh, natural resources. We have huge uh, uh, problem on pasture degradation. And uh, lastly, but not least, it, uh, we have, again, you know, the adequate, inadequate capacity at local levels in regard to land and your governance. So with this, uh, VGGT uh, first came to Mongolia in 2014. It was first introduced to the parliamentarians and policymakers, uh, different stakeholders uh, related to land uh, tenure, and it was received very uh, positively by the country. Uh, it's considered as a very timely and set of guidelines that could really support the, the uh, to improve uh, land tenure legislation at the national level. So since then, I think it's for four years, more than four years, we have implemented the uh, BGGT uh, different interventions, like uh, uh, organizing multiple times, multi-stakeholder uh, conversation, dialogues, uh, series of trainings on BGGT to uh, capacity uh, development trainings uh, on, on different tenure issues, and we involve the CSOs, NGOs, private sector, central government, local government, pastoral community leaders, champions, and uh, local champions. We included every uh, level of stakeholders in this whole process. And as you see uh, in this screen, uh, uh, we also uh, translated and printed out uh, different uh, uh, materials, documents that developed on the VGGT into local language. And some of them even contextualized into Mongolian context and distributed it to the uh, locals and also to, uh, to the policy makers and to the professionals, private sectors. And we even developed a comic book on, on VGGT specifically on how to really safeguard and uh, recognize, safeguard the, the tenure rights of pastoral herders. So all in all, just want to, uh, there are a number of results, actually outcomes uh, we have on the VGGT. And just want to mention these three uh, main points. First, we have now national monthly stakeholder platform where we talk about the uh, uh, tenure issues and where they uh, capacitate the stakeholder platform, where they can capacitate the local uh, government people and uh, stakeholders. Plus, you know, like uh, raise the voices of local people to the policymakers. 
And under the when we were implementing under the implementation of the VGGT uh, draft law on pasture land was revised, assessed first against the VGGT principles and then revised. And then also forest legislation uh, against VGGT was uh, assessed and all these revisions and assessments were compiled and uh, distributed to the stakeholders, stakeholders, specifically to the policy makers so that they can use when uh, use this whenever they uh, need to update or create a new legislation, regulation related to land tenure. So as a result of this, Alonga is a core uh, only and core government land uh, agency in Mongolia. They took the uh, initiative and uh, seek, uh, and uh, have a regulation developed securing the legitimate rights regulation developed and approved by the land agency director and uh, where the legitimate tenure rights firstly uh, mentioned and highly considered in the regulation and it's now part of the some landscape development planning so maybe uh, you all know that vggt is very high level document and uh, the, the language is very legal language it's sometimes we had the challenge to uh, inform or give information and explain it to the local people. But that was our really challenge. So while uh, thanks to implementing these tenure issues, you know, like uh, the VGGT, we, the NGO, Peace People Centered Conservation NGO, we actually uh, acquired, uh, uh, sorry, some technical problem, sorry, just a moment. Nara, do you need any support from our side? Oh, no, I, I'm all good now. I'm okay. okay. Sorry, very sorry for that. No, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, with this very high level document and also the written in a very uh, difficult legal language, you know, like it was a really challenge for us to inform uh, and uh, to the pastoral community leaders and champions so that they can use in their day-to-day -day life when they deal with the tenor issues. So uh, we actually acquired lots of knowledge and experience on land tenure issues, specifically about legitimate and customary tenure rights of pastoral herders. So, and most importantly, we could extend our network. So we actually joined the WALTS project. WALTS is a global project, uh, women's land tenure security project. We joined the project in 2017. We worked with the uh, Bokora UK based uh, non profit organiza uh, research organization in Hakamedini in Tanzania. So, the key uh, 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 objective of the, of the uh, WALS project was uh, to uh, secure the land tenure, uh, uh, specifically, uh, we talk about the gender issues, mining, and uh, different tenure issues, and to improve the land governance and improve the gender equality, equity on this matter. So we have a uh, lot of good uh, outcomes from the project, but I just want to highlight one of this. And uh, this is uh, under this project, we did uh, very different, uh, you know, like uh, interventions and local interventions, action oriented research work, but we actually did uh, different uh, activities with the local champions. One of them is we, uh, uh, we with land agency, develop step-by-step -step guidelines and developing gender sensitive and inclusive land management plan based on VGGT principles. So this is very uh, simple and understandable language written and step-by-step -step guidelines where we use a lot of participatory tools and techniques, techniques so that we can involve more local men, men and women, multiple people, when they, whenever they discuss about the land in issues, specifically the land management plan they do. They develop. So most importantly, this guideline from the beginning involved local people, champions, gender and land champions, and we, where they uh, uh, participated in our training workshops, 
and the local government. And it, this guideline was tested in several places and it was uh, received by the local people very positively. And they could, they say, you know, that effectively and efficiently, they use it, they could do this, uh, uh, do their uh, management plan in a very participatory way. People like it because it's a fun, you know, like fun and interesting way how they uh, do this, do their land, land management plan in gender sensitive and inclusive participatory way. So that's why, uh, you know, like a land agency requested, well, the land agency that I actually uh, mentioned before requested us uh, to give a training on this, uh, uh, manage on these guidelines, 330 local land officers, community leaders, and provincial level experts. We gave a training and online training, series of online training we did, and then also face-to-face -face training. And uh, and uh, now, you know, like we have, uh, we receiving uh, PCC and also our team receiving uh, different requests from uh, other projects, provincial level, local level, land officers, land tenure experts asking to give a training online, on, on ground training, how to use this guideline. And one of them is a pro, uh, FO project, FO slash WWF project, and it's funded by GEF. It's a project promoting dry and sustainable landscape and biodiversity conservation in the eastern state of Mongolia. So they're also using this integrated approach where they uh, gather uh, this multi sectoral and also uh, multi stakeholder working groups in local area where they have this, uh, not only land officers, they included in this working group, uh, social workers, hydrology, meteorology officer, even police officers in, involved with their urban uh, and the rural development officers, all the officers actually uh, come up gathered and they start uh, developing their uh, government, uh, uh, land management planning. So these guys also uh, asked us to give the training uh, on how to use this guideline because they really want to make this guide uh, make this make the management plan for securing the land tenure specifically in the dry land of Mongolia, dry land communities to make it more participatory so that they can use and implement implementable uh, development plan. So in last year, December, we did uh, the training on this. And um, yeah, it seems like it is uh, based it's based on the principles, but uh, um, people are uh, very uh, you know like specifically the stand of certain local people and the government uh, were happy to use these guidelines and they even uh, included in their guidelines the national guidelines. So all in all, you know, just want to uh, say summarize you know like VGT principles are still. Uh, you know, like uh, considered in the, in the regulations, but in the local area, we want to really uh, make it useful if it, so that uh, local people can uh, really uh, jointly uh, uh, develop their management plan is the core team. So thank you so much. And if you have a question, please. Yeah. So much, Nada. It was a very, very winter's presentation. And there was just one question on the chat asking how, like, if we could share a few tools on how to better engage farmers in the VGDT process. I think we should ask Nada because it's clear that what they are doing is really from the ground and you have developed several tools to assure a better, a very intense participation. So congratulations and please share with us all the material you may have because I think there is a lot of knowledge there that we need also to share with other countries. So again, we are really behind the time. So I'm asking all the panelists to be a bit like aware of their time and not go a bit over their uh, 10 minutes presentation. Our next speaker is Sarah Hobson and she will share an experience of lantenary and grazing management in Georgia. So how we coordinate legislation and the reality. So what's happening on the policymakers' head and what's really happening on the fields. Uh, Sarah Hobson has a long uh, experience in the region working on the livestock production system, pasture management and land tenure. Uh, she worked with Hack Caucasus 
and she also developed several documents for focus on Georgia. Um, Sara, thank you so much for being here with us today. The floor is yours. Thanks. Can I ask Nara to unshare her screen because I cannot share? Um... Um, Selini, can you help us here in sharing screen? That's it. Okay. okay. Great. Aurelie, maybe. Can people see okay. my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Right, so I'm going to talk about um, pastoral land reform in Georgia and um, its relevance uh, to some of the pathways in the technical guidelines and to LDM. So I'll start off with the, the situation and the links to land degradation. First of all, well, what resources are we talking about here? I mean, about 46% of rural households in Georgia possess livestock and pastures cover over 25% of the country's total land. So it's a very important resource and livestock are very important to the rural community. And pastures are used through a variety of sedentary or near village, transhumance and long distance migratory patterns. Yet very few of these many livestock owners actually hold any formal rights to pasture. So as we can see from this graph, um, meant, um, here, only about 20% of households hold any formal tenure. So the green is the natural um, holdings with, with, with any title over pasture and the orange is holdings with livestock. So many more people have livestock than pasture. Most pasture is owned by, formally by various state bodies or municipalities and they're supposed to be leased to users as individuals for four, up to 49 years. Yet only a small fraction of this pasture has been issued to title holders. So most pastures are used informally. Now, why is this a problem? Because users without rights to pastures are undocumented and unrepresented. They cannot be integrated into management systems, for example, um, planning or target setting around land degradation neutrality. They're vulnerable to having their pastures annexed by those who are able to obtain legal title. OK, so the recognition and documentation of legitimate tenure rights enables rights holders to engage and contribute to LDN initiatives. So this cannot happen if they do not have any rights. So the question is, why are they, do the users not have rights over pasture land? What are the gaps in the legal framework? So as I mentioned, um, pastures are held by the state or, or municipalities. And in most cases, not all, but in, in, in the majority of cases, the land tenure system is, is a leasehold um, to, to individuals, okay? And this leasehold is allocated through uh, electronic auction held at the national level, okay? Auctions hand pasture to the highest bidder. Mm. Yet most uh, livestock owners own, own far too few stock to participate in leasehold auctions. If we look at these graphs here, we can see most people only have a few sheep and a couple of cows. Now, nobody's going to participate in a, in a complex, expensive process such as an electronic auction um, on, for these kinds of livestock numbers. So other barriers include uh, computer literacy as well. So it's difficult for many people to participate in these auctions. So how do users actually access pasture? So smallholders, who are, of course, the majority of users, tend to herd their animals collectively, pooling them together, using villages, and nearby summer pastures as a common resource. They display strong de facto, informal, but de facto traditional rights to these grazing lands based on historical use patterns. And municipalities have the power to veto auction results if they believe that the pasture is needed for local users. And they often do so. So this is a reflection that we have the formal system on one hand, which, which allocates pasture in a certain way and an actual system um, on the ground and there's a mismatch between the two and this situation reflects um, the situation on pastures in many many post-soviet republics and was also the case in Kyrgyzstan for example before um, the system which Elvira was talking about was implemented. So what is the solution? Uh, the solution in Georgia has been to think about um, pasture management um, again from scratch and to development and to develop a national pasture land management policy document at the national level. 
So this document um, is a concept for system-wide pasture management policy, which has a number of key principles. And these include the idea that tenure systems should reflect how pastures are actually used on the ground. Livestock owners using pastures, however small, should be able to formalize access from, for, to the pasture in some way. Okay, so traditional users should be protected from land speculation through tenure regimes. And this disposal and man management um, should be undertaken um, at the local level. Now, in, in terms of the technical guides, um, you know, this document should be the basis for a new legislative framework and institutional arrangements. So this reflects pathway one that was mentioned earlier, the idea of enhancing policy and legal frameworks. Um, it should recognize and document legitimate tenure rights on public lands and recognize and document tenure rights for sustainable management of commons. So these are the pathways um, in the VGTT, which are reflected in this document. So to summarize the core elements, on state and municipal owned pasture lands, both individual and common property regimes will be available. This is because on some kinds of pastures, in fact, most people are leasing as individuals. In others, they are on the ground using the pasture in a, as common property. The decision on which tenure regime is appropriate in different areas, um, is to be decided at the local level through a pasture use planning process, including evaluations of these existing traditional um, claims to pasture. And this process will include pasture condition assessments for LDN target setting and implementation, so integrating that into this overall process. And the state will promote sustainable management through support for establishment of pasture use associations where common property um, is the tenure regime to be implemented and through extension services. So what are the challenges to implementation? Um, there are a number of institutional issues. So one of the issues is that, um, you know, this system should be implemented um, locally, but municipalities directly manage a small number of, a uh, small amount of pastures. Most pasture is owned by state agencies who do not have a present local presence. So this is one institutional issue. Um, there's a lack of criteria for identifying these different types of pasture lands, which are going to be eventually under different tenure regimes. Um, there is obstacles to the implementation of pro common property regimes um, around the lack of experience of these regimes in Georgia, which until now has only had individual tenure regimes on any type of land. Um, these common property regimes are widely considered appropriate only for smallholders on village pastures, even though some other areas are also used in common. Pilots suggest that it's going to be difficult to organize um, pasture users associations, especially if the, uh, there's this idea that people will have to pay for pasture because at present people are using it informally and freely. So the next steps is the development uh, of, of a legislative framework based on this uh, on the national document. So turning it into, into actual legislation and assessing the impact of that leg legislation vis-a-vis um, -vis other um, legislation in Georgia land code. And the development of pasture lands municipal management plans for target municipalities. So this is a kind of targeting of these arrangements, um, piloting, sorry, of these arrangements. Um, to see how they work on the ground and, and what needs adjustment in terms of the document and the uh, associated legislative framework. And one of the other things which is, um, which is planned is, is study tours um, by Georgian policymakers to see um, common property regimes um, in action um, in other parts of the world. So thanks very much. Um, if there's any questions, just, just let me know. I'm happy to re respond. I would. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think um, you start to see a bit more, like I think it's become a bit more clear to our participants how we translate from a very technical and high level document actions to the ground and then how we add the, the police layer, which I think is very challenging because 
um, because it's very difficult to connect these two words. Sometimes the reality we have from the field and the reality we have at the policymaker level, it's very difficult. Uh, I think Georgia is a very is a very great case. So at this moment, we have uh, one question to Nara. Maybe uh, I will ask. She said that she maybe she will answer on the Q and A chat. And I'm I would like to ask all the participants. I can see some um, participants who has raised their hands. I would kindly ask you to write your questions or your comments on the Q and A chat because uh, we are not going to open the mic to the participants at this moment because we are really, really behind our schedule. So if you have any questions to Sara or, or Nara, please just write them down. And uh, you move forward. Let's move forward with our next presentation. And please keep adding your questions there. And we are trying to keep all them. We are trying to answer them as soon as possible. So Sasha, thank you for being with us again. And I don't need to introduce you again because you have presented with us and we are going to discuss a little bit about the importance of the national consultations. I think this is a topic that both Nada and Sara mentioned about the importance of having a, a very broad numbers of stakeholders involved in this discussion. So Sasha, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thanks again, Carolina. Um, so yeah, I wanted to give you a, a brief overview of, of what we're planning uh, in terms of the consultations. Uh, so if I would just remind you of the mandate we have from our Conference of the Parties. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the, the COP, as we call it, um, it, issues decisions. And those decisions typically involve requests um, to themselves, uh, to country parties, inviting them or encouraging themselves to do something, uh, as well as requesting the secretariat and other partners um, uh, to undertake uh, various activities. So uh, just to pull out a couple um, a couple things from the decision, we see that the the, there's an encouragement to uh, to parties to host inclusive and participatory national level dialogues. Uh, so we would like to uh, to see how we can help countries with that uh, particular uh, invitation. Uh, also, um, explore ways to integrate uh, land uh, administration or land tenure information into their capacity development efforts. Uh, and uh, the, the decision also invited uh, the Secretariat and partners uh, to provide upon request support to parties in order to implement a land tenure strategy and action plan, as well as to develop specific guidance and exchange lessons learned through national consultations in selected countries across regions. So we will we will focus on that, and um, we will um, also just um, to say that the the concept of a of a national consultation is is quite elastic, and will depend on the capacity needs uh, of those countries that submit an application for this uh, request for support. Now, um, uh, you know, central to the application will be. Uh, a convening ministry, organization, or, or specialized agency uh, within a country that has the mandate to address land tenure issues uh, is also would also be responsible uh, for, uh, for hosting the consultation and in whatever form that consultation takes, uh, and will collaborate with the support team uh, to structure the content and the modalities uh, to ensure uh, diverse stakeholder engagement in the consultation. Uh, then as uh, we would also um, require that there would be some supporting organizations or entities. And these would be uh, expected to ensure multiple sectors and diverse stakeholders are mobilized and represented in the consultation. 
and as well as having the capacity to contribute um, with their expertise and their experience in, in relevant areas um, that the country has, um, has identified as, uh, as a particular need. <clears throat> uh, just to go back, I, we also um, clarify that the UNCCD National Focal Point and, and their ministry will be either a, a convening or a supporting uh, organization uh, in this application process. So we, we like to learn as much information as possible from this application form. Um, and uh, one of the uh, primary uh, um, reasons uh, for requesting the support. So this could be to convene a national dialogue, establish a multi-stakeholder platform, uh, work on a national strategy action plan, uh, or um, issues related to integrating the principles and practices of the VGDT into land restoration initiatives. Uh, and then finally, this could be at the project or programmatic level uh, where there are uh, ongoing uh, restoration initiatives uh, that want to uh, integrate land tenure uh, into their into their efforts. <clears throat> and this could happen at the subnational uh, or even the local level. Um, we also would like to see uh, uh, an overview of what, what restoration initiatives are happening in your country and where are the, how do they correspond uh, to the Rio conventions or how do they correspond to other global or regional processes and commitments uh, so that we have a better understanding uh, of, of, of the request and, and how it fits into uh, future planning. Uh, we also uh, like to hear about the uh, expectations. Well, what are the outputs um, that you would like to see from a national consultation? Is it, is it purely to raise awareness and uh, increase outreach uh, to civil society or the private sector? Is it a, a technical assessment of uh, legal and institutional frameworks? Um, again, the multi-stakeholder mechanism, does it, is it there already? Does it need to be strengthened or uh, do we need to uh, build it from scratch? Um, other countries may be um, interested in looking at ways to address, address youth and gender disparities uh, as it relates to uh, control and access of, of land resources. Uh, so we're, we're, we're willing to, um, uh, to provide assistance or strategic guidance on that. Um, and then there might be just a, a, a more practical applications of the VGGT. Uh, so some countries in the, in the, over the last 10 years, um, as Mongolia, as um, uh, various other countries have uh, translated the VGGT into more accessible language uh, or into languages that are understood uh, by local communities. Um, there's a whole a variety of, uh, of issues that uh, we, we would be uh, willing to support. Um, so in terms of the, um, the logistics of the application process, uh, next week, we will open up a, um, a notification, uh, a call for applications. So you will all receive that, that notification. Uh, and this will go to uh, not only our focal points, but um, the other Rio Convention, Ramsar, uh, United Nations Forum on Forests, uh, other Jeff focal points, uh, but it also be open to all stakeholders. Uh, and so there will be a, a dedicated web page, which will have all the information there uh, in terms of how to submit uh, an application. Uh, the deadline for submissions is uh, the middle of July. So that provides us with a uh, approximately a six week uh, or seven week window uh, by which um, uh, various um, actors and stakeholders in a country 
can get together and, and, and talk about it and see how to um, package uh, the most robust um, uh, multi-stakeholder application um, for, for, for this type of support. Um, we hope to have a notification out to countries that are selected uh, by September and then um, begin the, the consultations or preparations for the consultations uh, throughout the rest of this year and then um, into 2024. Um, the applications must include the completed PDF form. So we'll have a, a, P, a fillable PDF uh, where you'll have check boxes and text boxes where you'll be able to elaborate uh, various um, details. Um, we will also require, as indicated in the in the PDF, official letters from your ministries, uh, organizations, uh, again, specialized agencies, uh, and so forth, uh, in support of this application. And then finally, uh, there will be a, a number of um, uh, sections um, in the application form requesting uh, supporting documentation, uh, and this could be related to uh, land restoration or uh, existing uh, legal frameworks, uh, so that we get a, a very comprehensive picture uh, of the capacity needs uh, and and how we can better um, best um, um, support those. Um, applications, as I mentioned, must include the UNCCD National Focal Point and their corresponding ministry. Uh, so this could be either in a convening or a supporting role. Um, and then finally, we would just encourage uh, all interested stakeholders uh, to begin consultations um, with the UNCCD and climate change and biodiversity national focal points, um, FAO national offices, um, other prominent uh, NGOs and, and CSOs that are working in the domain of land tenure. Uh, and um, this is in response to one of the questions that I that I saw um, uh, in the chat um, was that, uh, yes, CSOs and NGOs uh, can participate in this. Uh, we just need them uh, to coordinate uh, with the respective um, national focal points and other uh, stakeholders in the submission of the application. So with that, I would just, uh, I'll close here and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have about this process. Thank you very much. And so colleagues, any questions to Sasha, please write them on the chat. You give people a few minutes, so no, please don't be shy. I think I think otherwise it, uh, my presentation was very clear. Uh, about the process. Uh, many of you who are associated with the UNCCD or, or accredited stakeholders, CSOs, are, are familiar with our notification process. Um, I would just say that um, we stand ready here at the Secretariat um, to help facilitate any coordination or any communication you might need. Uh, uh, our website, uh, the CBD website, is very accessible in terms of getting to the national focal point and getting their email address and their contact details. So, uh, so I would encourage you as, as a first step, uh, you, could, um, you could pursue that. But if you have any difficulties or have any further questions uh, about the process, then uh, we would be happy to help you here at the Secretariat to the best of our ability. Um, it will, the, the, the actual application will be sent by the convening uh, ministry. Uh, so that could be the UNCCD's ministry where the UNCCD focal point sits, uh, but it, it, it doesn't have to be. Uh, in, in the case that the, the UNCCD is a supporting agency, 
then they will issue a official letter of support and they will mention the, the convening ministry. So the convening ministry could be um, the Ministry of Agriculture or the Ministry of the Environment or uh, Land Administration uh, Specialized Agency uh, who would, would uh, take a convening role. <clears throat> Any other question to Sasha? Let's take the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have any other questions, I think we are moving towards our end of our webinar and the discussion uh, of today. Uh, I really hope this is a, a first of many opportunities that okay we have another question maybe Sasha you can take a look okay um, um, yes so I mean that that is exactly what what the cop uh, mandates us is is to to share experiences um to contextualize the technical guide to bring it down to the ground in a specific, biophysical socioeconomic context. So, so when, when these applications come, we, we wanna see that uh, so that we can then bring together all of the resources available to us at the international and regional level with all of our partners uh, so that we can um, very much target uh, those needs. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Tokia, uh, for that question. Okay, so, okay, so Neil has answered. I, I think one point that I would like to highlight because uh, all the, the participants, you have our email. So FAO and UNCCD team are here to help and facilitate uh, this whole process. And this is something that for us is really important. And when we get requests, we are very happy. And on this specific topic, I think we, we work as a team. So if you prefer to write to someone you know, uh, someone you have a better connection, we are going to share your requests and you'll find the best person to answer or to address your concerns. So we really work very close together on this topic. I think this is one of the, the situations when you have very good coordination between different areas and different sectors in both the convention and FAO. Um, and just a few remarks. So we, we move towards our uh, closing process of this webinar. Uh, the discussion is not easy. I think when you have the wording uh, counting situation, we have a challenging or complex and it is, and we are aware of it. But we also could see today very good cases that we could translate all this complexity into something that works. And when you mention that something that works, we need to take into consideration all the levels. So the farmers, men and women, so the gender differences that we may have on the land tenure process, the layer of local policymakers, how we can address the situation. The second layer, that is the national policy making process. So how all these layers, they need to connect and talk to each other. And then you go to the global and all these international commitments, the human GNFL. So it's complex, but it's possible. So I think that's uh, the message that I would like to, to close that. It's difficult, but it's happening. So it's up to us to find ways and push ourselves and also push our policymakers to give a step further on this agenda. And the other point is a step by step. Don't expect to solve all the problems at once. I think we need to understand the most complicated or the most feasible solutions and look at this one. Don't try to look to the whole problem at once because then we get stressed and we, we give up. But let's look to where and how like little pieces can be solved and we keep moving uh, forward. 
I think it's really important to also thank to our partners. So today we have a collection of amazing, amazing speakers. And again, the work that everybody is doing from global, international, and local level is what gives us this very beautiful puzzle where the pieces are finally uh, fell in place. So this is something that we need to always acknowledge that we, we don't move forward without other fund stakeholders. Uh, and as a way to, to close this in a different way, we are going to close the webinar today with a video. So we hope this video can give you hope that a different future is possible and also inspire you to look and push for a change. I don't know who you share. Okay, the video is coming. And this is our goodbye. I don't know if the panelists would like to say some goodbye to all the participants, but uh, I'm saying on behalf of all the speakers, thank you for all the participants with us today. <laughs>